continuation of the Lansing Park Tech Technical Committee main meeting. Uh, we'd like to introduce and welcome uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects uh, for their presentation on sites. So, uh, is it Lynette that I should be yes. presenting or asking? Lynette Strauss, Professional Practice Manager of ASLA. Hunter Becker, Vice President, Professional Practice Fellow of ASLA. Jamie Stetter, Vice President, Strategic Relationships, United States Green Building Council, USGBC. And Micah Silvey, Director of Certification at USGBC, and I apologize if I might have slashed your name a little bit, but we got it. We did. So, with that, Lynette. Thank you. You're looking at the site's timeline. Despite the clear success of green building, there have been no national standards until now to guide those who want to create sustainable landscapes. With the population increasing, land development will have an even more profound impact on the Earth's ecological systems. It was recognized that a system and framework was needed to define sustainable land development. The Sustainable Sites Initiative is a set of comprehensive voluntary guidelines together with a rating system that assesses the sustainable design, construction, and maintenance of landscapes. Site certification is a separate standalone certification for landscapes independent of LEED certification. As you can see here on the timeline, it started in 2005 and developed over the years through a successful pilot phase to open enrollment in 2015. The four primary goals of sites uh, create regenerative, regenerative systems and foster resiliency. So the question is, how is a regenerative design different from sustainable design? Sustainable design typically lasts over a time without degrading, but it, but it does not necessarily regenerate itself or create something new. A regenerative system makes no waste, its output is equal to or greater than its input. Regenerative design uses biomimicry or the study of ecological systems to find solutions. One element of this is to use all species within an ecological system. In recent years, we've, had, we've witnessed several costly examples of communities being devastated by storms and weather systems. Through those examples, we've analyzed how resilient planning and design might have mitigated some of the impact. As designers, engineers, and managers of the environment, it's essential to make forward-thinking choices and understand how our decisions can impact resources, resource supply. And later, we'll discuss how sites can help to transform design, development, and maintenance practices. Uh, I, I turn this over to Hunter, whose, whose project this was, uh, one of the site's pilot projects. It's an example of a project that received Platinum LEED certification and then later received a three-star site's pilot rating. Hunter, yeah. talk a little bit more about Just real quickly, the, the left column and the right column, top to bottom, the, the top two images are from the same location, same project. Sorry they're a little dark in the room, but what you see basically is a before and after of the the retention area for the stormwater, but what we, on the on the left hand column, and what we did was turn it into an, a, a repairing aquatic ecosystem that had uh, human contact into the water, buffered the the edges so the siltation wouldn't happen, just to make it a healthier, happier place for water quality and then also the the surrounding aquatic habitat. So that was just one example of how a stormwater basin turned into a healthier aquatic ecosystem. Thanks, Mr. So the foundation of sites is based on ecosystem services. Sustainable landscapes provide ecosystem services and the criteria outlined in the version two of the sites rating system were developed following the concepts of ecosystem services. So what is an ecosystem service? It's any positive benefit that people gain from environmental resources and ecosystems. The benefits can range from provisional to supporting. It can include the interaction of living elements such as plants and organisms and non-living elements like water or air. Some examples are drinking water, waste treatment, erosion control, flood control, pollination, uh, food and renewables, and carbon storage. They can also provide indirect benefits like recreation and cultural services. These services exist at a variety of scales and are often unseen and therefore they are difficult to measure or monetize. But a growing body of research supports that ecosystem services can protect and preserve a community's resilience and quality of life without the need for expensive technological replacements. 
And on the political front, in October of 2015, the White House released a memorandum directing federal agencies to factor in the value of ecosystem services into federal planning and decision making. Oops, sorry. Design landscapes can conserve resources or waste and degrade them. The effects of poor landscape design can lead to damaged soils and erosion, introduction of invasive species, dependence on chemicals, and more. If planned design constructed and maintained correctly, landscapes can mitigate and even reverse harmful impacts that can arise from the misuse of natural systems. Landscapes can protect, restore, and enhance natural resources. As part of the review of the site's rating system, there was a two-year pilot phase. Pilot projects were reviewed and certified under the guidelines and performance benchmarks of the 2009 site's version rating system. This process provided valuable feedback on the rating system and informed the development of the current site's version 2 rating system and reference guide. At the start of the project, there were 150 pilot projects that were chosen to participate, and at the close of the pilot phase, 47 projects were certified located in 20 states across the United States and included parks, streetscapes, campuses, and more. I'm happy to report that California, I believe, had the largest number of pilot projects, totaling seven. This is an example of a regenerative landscape. A little hard to see, but you'll see on the left, it's a common suburban front lawn. And um, the, the redesign of this um, was based on the um, premise of having a, a, a landscape that can actually regenerate itself. And so they planted a little agricultural patch in the front of this lawn. They could have a little vegetable garden. These are the, sit, the 10 guiding principles of sites. The ideas inform the specific criteria that are included in the rating system. These principles can be applied both to land design and the development process. Sites is also based on a decision-making hierarchy. And, and just looking through this diagram, um, which is included in the rating system, it provides a step work, a step-by-step -step framework for an initial analysis of a project. It lays the groundwork for ensuring that a high-performing end product, whether it is protecting existing ecosystem services or purposefully creating new systems to meet sustainability goals. And the initial evaluation of your project will determine if conservation, management, restoration, or generation is the appropriate path to follow. Conservation is the most optimal as it yields the greatest level of performance through the process stage, the ultimate goal, and it requires the least amount of interaction. So if existing conditions are healthy but have not been maintained, then it might be necessary to manage sites. Um, so if a landscape has undesirable elements, such as invasive species, they need, would need to be removed in order to enhance the function of the ecosystem and end with a high-performing landscape. If the ecosystem is poor, for example, the landscape might be lacking in large, healthy trees, then restoration might be the correct path. And that means that the project would include planting trees in, over, in order to improve the overall ecosystem. Um, in the generate decision path, the project might require removal of materials and remediation, and then the addition of landscape features such as native trees in order to improve the overall ecosystem services. And this might exist in the, in the case of a brownfield that requires asphalt removal and then remediation. Realize that a site can, can, and can um, earn less points up front because it might be on the con conservation decision track. That's just an example for you, um, the case of a brownfield, as I mentioned. But there are ample opportunities to earn credits, say with the example of education on a site. So we'll cover more of that later on. Here's an example of the conserve and manage tracks. This is Hempstead Plains. It was a site-certified pilot project in Long Island, New York. It's the only natural occurring prairie east of the Allegheny Mountains, once covering almost 40,000 acres. It has been reduced to 60 disparate acres. During design and construction, measures were taken to ensure that the integrity of the existing parcels of prairie remain. However, in some areas, they required management by removing encroaching non-native species. And this example, which is also in New York, in the Bronx, uh, Hunts Point Landing, it's now a part of the, the, Bronx, the South Bronx Greenway Plan. It's an example of restore and generate. It was previously a street in an industrial zone surrounded by auto parts salvage yards and heavy duty truck traffic. The site required removal of asphalt and remediation. Situated at the confluence of the Bronx River, East River, and the Bronx Kill, the 1.5 acre site now offers panoramic views of the water, and the park pro programming also includes water-based activities such as 
fishing, kayaking, canoeing, and a restored shoreline that will serve as an educational demonstration of the interaction of fresh and tidal waters. I'm going to turn this over to Hunter and Micah, who will now talk to you about the rating system. Thank you, Lynette, and thanks for having us. In case it's not clear yet, the site's V2 standard is a rating system, essentially, that is used to define what sustainable land development is, much like LEED has done for buildings. And I work for the U.S. Green, Build US Green Building Council. Specifically, I'm the director of certification for GBCI, their certification wing. And we now own and operate sites and offer certification for sites. Jamie will be talking more about our relationship with sites, our ongoing relationship, and the certification availability at this point. But we have been involved with this tool for a long time. We helped develop it, and we really believe in it as a way to bridge that gap between how we've defined sustainable buildings and how we can define uh, outwards of the building skin. And we really believe that we need all of, uh, in order to, to really enhance and support the mission that U.S. Green Building Council has, we realized that there was a big gap, not just with buildings, but infrastructure and a number of other areas that uh, has really allowed us to move out of, the, or beyond LEED, I should say, and you might know that we, we are involved with a number of other programs at this point as well. But Sites V2 is a great rating system. It essentially consists of 10 sections, and within those sections, there are 18 prerequisites and 48 credits, uh, each describing certain sustainability measures that have been defined through the process. Uh, all of the prerequisites would need to be met in order to, uh, to achieve a certification. That's the baseline. And then we're looking for a number of other credits to be earned to get you enough points to meet a certain certification level, whatever certification level is the goal for that project. Where possible, the, the strategies outlined in the rating system are performance-based so to sort of maximize the flexibility and innovation from, from project teams in order to achieve their goals rather than being prescriptive-based. The, the sections are organized in the sort of typical development process, beginning with the site selection se section, moving on to a bunch of uh, requirements in the pre-design phase, then there are four design sections, starting with water, then soil and vegetation, material selection, and human health and well-being. Then we have a construction section and a section that focuses on operation and maintenance. And then lastly, there are a couple of sections that deal with education, monitoring, and, and innovation. What I'm going to do is just try to walk through the rating system fairly quickly so that you you can get a sense of some of the measures that are included in the standard. We can't get into everything here, obviously. It would take a long time. But I'll highlight some of the very important things that really uh, that sort of define the rating system for me and what really important for you guys to think about. And as I'm doing that, Hunter will jump in with some examples of how some of the pilot projects that he was involved with uh, maybe approached some of these important prerequisites and credits. So with that, we'll start with the first section, which is the site selection section. Uh, you, the coloring is not coming up on the slide, but uh, I've actually highlighted the, the prerequisites in blue on my screen, and uh, it, because it's important to really understand the difference between the prerequisites and, and the credits. And the, the top four, uh, the P1.1 through P1.4, are prerequisites and, and required for all projects pursuing the system. And essentially what they, they state is that Early on in the process, very early on in the process, it, it, you need to understand the broader context of your project. And you either would need to avoid the sensitive site features that are described in the standard, or you need to protect those features if they are within your project development in a way that is described in the rating system and we'll talk about in a minute. So if, you, if the project in question has uh, prime farmland, uh, floodplains, aquatic resources, or uh, habitat for threatened or endangered species, those areas would need to be protected through the process described, um, in the, the process I'll describe shortly. This section also, require, also allows you to get additional points for developing in a, a more uh, um, developed area and for connecting to transit networks and uh, redeveloping degraded sites. So you can, you can get additional points here for reducing the pressure on undeveloped land or greenfield land by locating your site in a more developed area locating your project. 
Yeah, so this is an example of a rural project, Swanner. It's a, a refuge in an, for an abundance of wildlife while offering engaging environmental science education programs. And the acres of wetlands are protected by conservation easements, and there's an ongoing wetland restoration which provides improved water quality for habitat for a rich variety of wildlife. The preserve covers more than 1,200 acres, and it's in the Snyderville Basin. And what is important to chapter one was it really it focused in this particular chapter it focused on protecting floodplain functions which is the prerequisite 1.2 and then also um, the conserve aquatic resources which is prerequisite 1.1 all right section two is the pre-design site assessment section and it looks short. There's only there's only four prerequisites and credits. And the first three are prerequisites, the P1 to 2.1 through P2.3. This is a, a, a short section, but probably the most important section in the entire rating system. It really sort of sets the foundation for the rest of it. So if you understand some of the requirements in, in this section, you're in good shape. It starts with requiring an integrative design process. So at the very beginning of the process, this the system requires that an integrated team be formed. And essentially, that team is then responsible for activities throughout the design and construction process, the design, construction, and even setting up for operations and maintenance. And I'll just highlight where those connection points uh, exist as we, as we go through the standard here. The second prerequisite is to conduct a pre-designed site assessment. This is the most important prerequisite in the entire rating system. Essentially what it does is it sets the baseline for much of the rest of the standard. And it's, it's, real, it's so important that we've, we've defined sort of what could be included through a series of worksheets uh, within a pre-designed site assessment. And if, if, that, if this prerequisite is documented correctly, it sort of makes the rest of the process a lot easier because again, the documentation flows from this, this pre-designed site assessment. And of course, you have a better site at the end of it because you're, you're looking at a site and taking full advantage of all the opportunities that that site has. The third prerequisite is to designate and communicate vegetation and soil protection zones. Essentially, what this is saying is that if you have sensitive site features on, on your site, like demonstrated in the previous section, that those features need to be protected through this process. Uh, so this is just built into the prerequisite here. And designating these zones can also gain projects additional points by highlighting and protecting healthy soils and healthy vegetation and other things that you've defined in the pre-designed site assessment. So you can see with three prerequisites here that early engagement with the standard is, is really key because there is these pre the critical pre-designed site assessment activities that need to happen that feed into the rest of the rating system. You want to talk about this Sure, one? yeah, this is West Point Foundry Preserve and it's in New York and there's a couple interesting features that relate to this particular chapter. Um, eight years of archeological study and input from the community and advisory groups enabled the design team to develop a sensitive plan for public access, habitat restoration, historic preservation, and interpretation. Um, they also had uh, over 14 different firms, interdisciplinary firms, or, or agencies that were involved in their stakeholder groups as the project developed. And it's also one that Lynette mentioned er earlier. It, it didn't, in, it's an 87 acre site, but it didn't require a lot of design intervention. So it, um, that determined, helped determine what level of certification it got. And as it relates to, to this particular chapter, they use an integrated design process and engage users and stakeholders, which would be the prerequisite 2.1 that Micah just talked about, and then credit 2.4. Um, they, they focused on those in particular. Okay, the third section, and the first of the four design sections, is site design water. There are two prerequisites here. The first requires that a certain size storm event be managed on site. It's the 60th percentile event for the prerequisite which is a fairly small storm event, and by managed on site, we mean infiltrated, evaporated, or reused on site. Essentially, that water is not uh, leaving the site and entering a municipal system, for example. And the second prerequisite requires a reduction of water for landscape uh, irrigation. Uh, these are obviously important 
Um, this is an important section for California with the drought. And uh, this is prerequisite 3.2, and then the, the following credit, which requires a progressively larger reduction in potable water use for irrigation, uh, is the, the two key credits, I think, when we're looking at um, conserving water. Although managing stormwater properly and reusing that water is also helpful in many contexts. So you get additional points, like I said, for, for reduce, further reducing the amount of water, potable water you're using for irrigation and for managing progressively larger rainfall events on site, up to the 95th percentile event. This section also awards points for designing your stormwater features as, as what we call functional amenities, uh, may, maybe uh, making them pretty and accessible to site occupants. And if you have a, uh, an aquatic ecosystem on site that is damaged, restoring that aquatic ecosystem back to its health is also a way to get points in this section. So our example on this one is urban context. This is uh, Washington Canal Park in Washington, D.C., and it has some pretty amazing hydrology statistics. I'll just go through them here for a second. Um, through the use of the linear rain garden, low-impact design tree pits, and approximately 80,000 gallons of underground cistern capacity, almost all of the stormwater runoff generated by the park is captured, treated, and reused to satisfy its 95% of the park's water needs for irrigation, fountain water, toilet flushing, ice rink water in the winter. So they really knocked it out of the park on this particular chapter. They got, they hit every credit, every prerequisite that Micah just mentioned. The only one that wasn't really addressed is the last one where the restore aquatic ecosystems because there wasn't one. But everything else they did for hydrology on the particular location was just amazing in an urban context. I think that's actually an important point because the the rating system has 200 points and a host of credits to get those points, but not all credits in the rating system are going to be applicable to every project, and that was really intentional. The idea was to, to create a system, a tool that could be applied to a huge range of project types, and so there are there are credits that certainly won't apply to each project. But but as Jamie will show you earlier, you, to get the, the highest certification level, which is platinum, you need 135 points out of 200. So there is a, a lot of flexibility in, in how you get to your certification level based on the project type you have and the, the region and the context and everything like that. The second design section is soil and vegetation, obviously a very important section in a sustainable sites rating system. There are three prerequisites here and a number of credits where you can get additional points. But the the... The first prerequisite is maybe the most important here and the one I want to highlight first is the, the one to create and communicate a soil management plan. And the whole rating system, uh, if I could point to one, or, one of two maybe important themes through the site's rating system, is the importance of soil. It really highlights the need to conserve existing healthy soil and protect it or restore soil back to its uh, healthy state. And so there's a real focus on soil. This, this prerequisite requires a, a detailed soil management plan that allows for that protection and restoration uh, and that needs to be in place before the construction begins so that that baseline is set for the contractor. There's also a prerequisite for controlling and managing invasive plants on your site and another one for using appropriate plants. In, in this context, appropriate plants don't, doesn't necessarily mean native plants, but it does mean native or adapted for your region. You then get the points for a number of other things. You can conserve healthy soils and vegetation that you've, that you've identified through your pre-designed site assessment, through that process I spoke of earlier, but using a vegetation and soil protection zone. You can get points for conserving and using only native plants if you want, uh, or, cons or native plant communities. For optimizing the biomass on site, essentially increasing the, the BDI against the baseline, uh, of the existing condition. And you can even use vegetation to get points here to reduce urban heat island effects, uh, to minimize building energy use, and reduce, reduce the risk of catastrophic wildflower. Wild, not catastrophic wildflowers don't exist, but <laughs> catastrophic wildfire. And, and that's another credit that wouldn't necessarily apply to all projects. This is just a quick example. This is one of the smallest projects. Um, 0.134 acres. They got very technical with that number. Um, one of the, the the thing that's interesting about this and the small scale is the diverse plant palette was chosen. 
which was appropriate for the modified site conditions, was disease resistant and excluded weed growth. And there was no need to irrigate after establishment due to the extensive soil modifications and proper plant selection. So the important thing to remember is you can't, it's not just about picking right plants or, or almost right plants. It's about making sure that you put them in a healthy bed. So the soils were important. So this, this really addressed the prerequisite 4.1 and 4.3 with the plant material. And then by optimizing the biomass, by definition, you're going to have to have healthy soils to go with those plants. Yes. All right. The next design section is material selection. There's only one prerequisite in this section, and that's to eliminate the use of wood from threatened tree species. But this section has a huge number of points that projects can use to obtain different certification levels. 42 points out of a total of 200, I believe. And if, if anyone's familiar with the, the LEED rating system, some of these are fairly similar in the sense that you're looking for materials that are regional, have recycled content, maybe... Uh, they're uh, reused or salvaged materials. But we also have some other credits here that I wanted to highlight, which is specifically credit 5.7 through 5.10. These these credits are really looking at um, supporting sustainability and transparency in the extraction and manufacturing processes. These credits are structured in the same way, and what they do is they offer a low low point value for simple advocacy, so essentially sending letters to your material suppliers, getting them to uh, get aware of the, uh, the information that you're looking for, and promoting uh, further transparency in their processes. And then you can get progressively more points in this section by actually sourcing your products from, from manufacturers that are transparent and then uh, are, are meeting certain sustainability benchmarks. See, they're tricky credits to earn, but they, they really speak to that market transformation goal that Lynette spoke of earlier. Mm -hmm. the, the credits here really cover the full materials life cycle, all the way from extraction to manufacturing, transportation, use, recovery, etc. So just the, that, uh, that's a nighttime shot, obviously. Um, this project is a, a medium-sized project. It's uh, the scenic Hudson Long Dock Park in New York. And what's interesting about this project as it relates to the materials section is um, the project returned public access to the river, remediated contaminated soils, rehabilitated degraded wetlands. In this part, it reused found materials that were on site and restored ecological diversity to upland wetland and intertidal zones. So that, that focus on um, 5.4, reuse salvage materials and plants, um, they actually found materials on site that they could reuse, repurpose, and not have to send them to landfills. So that's just props for that particular project. All right, another big section, the final design section, is human health and well-being. And that is, that is one of the primary goals, one of the four goals of the program is to promote human health and well-being. So this is a very important section where you can get a host of points. There are no prerequisites associated with this section, so all of these credits are optional but necessary uh, to pursue if you're looking for some of those higher certification levels. And I won't go through all of these, but essentially these credits are promoting access to, to nature, promoting opportunities for physical activity on site, promoting opportunities for social connection, uh, for mental restoration, that kind of thing. And they, they also have, we, we have credits here for food production on site. And I think this, this section has also got a nice social equity component because it's promoting access to your site, greater access, wayfinding and safety, lighting, that kind of thing. And then lastly, credit six, Point eleven support local economy sort of ties it all back to the greater social benefit of having a local workforce do the construction on your site. This is my favorite section. Um, this particular project, it, it looks like a, a small residential front yard, but here's the story. Three couples with the dream of aging in place formed a team of green building professionals to design and build four units to share a habitat friendly open space, which provides stormwater retention, food production and gathering place. So what you're looking at here is basically their cut flower garden in the front with a small little water feature. But if you saw photos on the website in the back, it's a much larger, completely 
planted with with pollinator fields and cut flowers and social spaces for dinners and things like that where now they can all come live together Asian place and have a social gathering place which is just great I mean this chapter pulls at your heartstrings of course and that's just one good example all right getting to section seven I believe is the construction section this section really starts with the importance of communicating all of those good sustainability goals and plans that you had at the beginning of the project through the construction phase. Because we all, we all know that they can sort of get forgotten, let's say. And the first prerequisite here actually requires that the integrated design team members from that team that you defined up front be attached to certain goals and achievement of certain credits in, in the rating system through construction. Then we have a prerequisite for controlling and retaining construction pollutants. That's just implementing your erosion control plan or stormwater pollution prevention plan, which is often required by law anyways. And then prerequisite 7.3, which is a really important one. Restore soils disturbed during construction. What this basically says is that any soils that are disturbed during construction that will exist in the final vegetated state, so they will be landscaped at, in, the, in the final design, need to be restored to a certain level. And that level is dictated by a reference soil from the site or the region. And that's part of the pre-designed site assessment is identifying that reference soil. So this, this grading system essentially, through this prerequisite, requires that the soil basically be restored, its physical, chemical, and biological characteristics be restored back to that reference soil and it does require soil, soil sampling to, to confirm that. This is definitely something that's sort of outside standard practice, I think, by requiring this soil sampling. The idea is to, if, you, if you're going to have a, a more uh, native or an appropriate plant palette and, and, and um, the right kind of plant community on your site, that you should be using soil that's appropriate and not just adding the standard organic content or mulch that most projects would. But then you get additional points here by restoring additional soil. So if, if you're taking a, a developed site, say parking lot or something like that, and restoring those soils back to uh, a reference soil condition, now, now you're getting additional points for that. And you're getting points for diverting construction and demolition materials, and, uh, vegetation and rocks and stuff like that from disposal. And you can get points for, for using the right equipment as well on site during construction. This is a great project to use as an example for this construction chapter. Um, this is a, it's a George Dock Cavalier Park in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, it's located on 34 acres of rugged desert terrain. And the site had been previously developed as part of North Scottsdale Regional Stormwater Management System, including the construction of a large earthen dam and two significant retention basins. Um, sustainable features at Cavalier Park include the on-site stormwater management, preservation and restoration of native plants and soils like Michael was talking about, um, and the reuse of materials salvaged on site. So this one really nailed that prerequisite 7.3, which, which what Michael just said, restore soils to serve during construction. Doing a construction project this big in a desert, I think they had lots of requirements that they had to address, and then also it, it address the 7.4, 7.5, and 7.6, which are the restore the soils um, disturbed from previous development, then diverting the construction and demolition of materials from disposal, and then divert reusable vegetation, rocks, and soil from disposal. So working in the desert, this is, this is just a great project for, to talk about the construction, the proper construction process. Okay, just about done here. Section nine, uh, eight, actually, is operations and maintenance. And what this section is about is essentially setting up a project for success once the construction is complete. This is a design and construction rating system. Certification is awarded at the end of construction. It, it, it doesn't extend through to the operations of the site. So essentially, the, the key for this section is to create a, a plan for sustainable operations and site maintenance. And the idea is that the integrated design team that was identified up front in the pre-design uh, section is, is contributing to this plan. And you can get addition, additional points here by basically uh, including various aspects into that plan. You can also get points in this section by using renewable sources for electricity needs and 
having certain policies and procedures around your landscape maintenance. So this is this is a great hydrology project. This is Anacostia Watershed Society headquarters, and the their plan for sustainable maintenance was implemented, including. Uh, minimizing pesticides and fertilizers for use to protect the watershed. So it really, um, in terms of operations and maintenance, they, they put a plan together to maintain not just their property, but whatever the effects of off-site work is going to be. So prerequisite 8.1, and then really focusing on minimizing pesticides and fertilizers for, for the runoff was one of the primary focuses on this one. And of note, it also is a, a, a very low budget and high highly successful project. They had a budget of $114,000, which most people think you need millions and millions of dollars to provide sustainable site design, but they had a, a reasonable budget and performed very high. Right, section 9 is education, and you get credit uh, points in this section essentially by communicating the, the good things you've done on your project and, and educating the marketplace. And then there's a credit, credit 9.3, plan to monitor and report site performance, which should probably be worth more than four points. But this is a really, really great credit because what it does is it, it requires that you set yourself up through funding and, and a plan to essentially identify some of the metrics that you want to monitor over time. This is just the plan piece. You set it up, and then, but you commit to the funding and to sharing the data. And we really think that getting information around site performance is something that is going to feed into the improvement of this standard and improve, improvement of sustainable land development overall. It's a growing field. So we, we feel like this is a, a great way to help catalyze that, uh, that field. <coughs> and then, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. About that. Um, just real quick, obviously talking about education, we wanted the university project. So Square 80 Plaza at George Washington University replaced an existing parking lot and several alleys with an urban plaza and pedestrian network that included low impact development techniques to target stormwater runoff and retain on site as well as an outdoor classroom um, for GW's new sustainable landscape program. And so obviously this promotes the sustainability awareness and education that Micah just mentioned in 9.1. And this happens, I think, in lots of the pilot projects that we've been talking about. Right, projects want to share their story, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we encourage it. Then there's a, a section that's wide open. It's just a section that allows for projects to come through with sustainability measures or proposals that are outside of the, the purview of the, of the rating system. We want to encourage innovation and further the understanding of sustainable site development. So you can get up to nine points just for coming up with your own proposals or metrics that you can that demonstrate to us. And that's it. That's the, the last section. The, this is the easy project to talk about for exemplary performance. This is FIPS. Um, it got the highest rating, highest certified rating project in the pilot project. And then it also, at the same time, got LEED Platinum certification as well as attained the Living Building Challenge certification. So they obviously knocked it out of the park with um, exemplary performance. And I think I'd run through a quick little... Yeah. And I, I won't, this is uh, just a quick example of how you would run through a, a particular prerequisite. So every prerequisite is going to have an intent, just to capture this on, on film. Um, so you'll want to read through the intent, apply it to your particular project. This is, pre this is prerequisite 1.1, which is limit development on farmland. So you'll read the intent, which is on the screen, apply it to your project, and then Basically, your project's either going to have farmland or it's not. So if you don't have farmland, which a lot of the urban projects didn't have, um, some of the other projects do, you would apply it to a particular case. So if you don't have farmland, you follow the rules for, the, for case one, which we'll show you here in a second. If you do, you have a choice between case two um, and case three, which is mitigation. And then what's great about sustainable sites initiative is they give you recommended strategies. So it's really, you just, you follow these rules. So you go to an NRCS website, you find your project location. This is a particular web, this is a, a snapshot of that website. And you follow, you just, it's point and click, point and click. You find your location, you screenshot. If you don't have farmland, 
um, that's your submittal documentation. If you do, then you have to document a little bit more. So there's a soil and vegetation pr protection zone that looks like this. Um, I won't go into details of everything you're looking at, but it's basically delineating where your project site is from what you need to protect against or from. Um, and then one last interesting thing in the prerequisites is one I, want, I always want to talk about the interrelated credits. So this is the highlighted left column is prerequisite 1.1, but what you see is it is interrelated with prerequisites 2.2, 2.3, 4.1, 7.1, 8.1, .1, all of which we just ran through that Michael was talking about as well as the optional credits 1.6, 4.4, and 6.7, as we just talked about. Um, so then just one last slide. This is the breakdown um, from the pilot phase that I was involved in. I had two of the 47 projects, but you can see on the screen um, that the, the Highest number of projects were open space and parks, but there's institutional and educational, commercial, residential, streetscape and transportation corridors, gardens and arboretums, government projects, mixed, mixed use projects, and industrial projects. Um, and they can range from 2,000 square feet to all the way, there is no larger limit, but over 100 acres were what were identified during the pilot phase. So now we're going to go back to Jamie, or to Jamie, not back to Jamie. Uh, to discuss the lead synergies with sites and cert the certification process. Well, and thanks again, everyone, for, for uh, listening in, uh, to those of you that are listening in, and to those of you that invited us. We're, we're really grateful to be here. Um, now that we've run through the rating system and um, you have a sense of how it works from a technical perspective, I do want to talk a little bit about why USGBC and GBCI, our sister organization, are in this business so you can get a sense of of how we can potentially support you in the work you're trying to do. So just real quickly, as, as you all probably gathered, we're um, most uh, relevant to this conversation because of our work on LEED. Uh, and the market transformation components related to LEED have been pretty dramatic. We're certifying millions of square feet a day. We've issued over 280,000 professional credentials, uh, LEED APs and the like. Um, and this is in under 20 years. So when we look back and think about um, how often um, green building and sustainability in buildings was just sort of thrown around as jargon, and now there's a very clear definitional element, um, we're not ready to declare success because there's a lot of work to be done, but it, it is pretty dramatic. And as a result, many organizations, including ASLA and um, their counterparts, had approached GBCI and USGBC about replicating lead for other um, parts of the built and unbuilt environment that needed sustainability to have metrics around it. Um, and we realized that our core competency was not, in fact, to develop those standards, but rather to rely on experts like ASLA um, and their landscape architect uh, community to develop the standards. But we were well positioned to bring that to market, to people that would be users, to governments, to professionals, and to commercial interests. So at, at this point, we've acquired several new rating systems, one of which is sites, which looks at the land. We're also working on rating systems that we see on this slide that cover other components, but we're here to talk about sites today, so I'll continue to focus on that. Uh, all of this is around um, thinking of building markets as the key component of how we drive change. Um, in, in the case of sites, we are uh, pretty focused on the fact that to drive outcomes, you need to change the process. Uh, that said, with LEED, we saw uh, increases in property values, increases in rents, very obvious monetary benefits for the LEED process that have emerged after 10 to 20 years. In the case of sites, we expect to see a very similar um, amount of uh, monetary value created for owners, operators, etc. cetera, uh, although some might be a little less obvious. And in the case of a government, this is clearly what you all are looking at, managing stormwater runoff, conserving energy by reducing heat island effect, improving air quality, things like that, and, and we want to just put this out there to say we know that these are definitely value creators, uh, that SITES is intended to very much track these and promote these in the long run. Uh, stepping back a second, we do want to highlight a couple things on LEED synergies. Uh, because SITES version 2 and LEED version 4 were developed at the same time, there's some natural overlaps between these. 
The major difference uh, is the unit of measurement. Obviously, SITES evaluates a site with or without a building. LEED evaluates a building that may, uh, and potentially the site related to it. Um, in this case, when we're looking at some of these synergies, uh, we're looking at this one, which is a pre-design assessment. If you achieve this credit in SITES, uh, it will mean that you will achieve that credit in LEED. Uh, the reverse is also true in some cases, such as diverting construction and demolition materials from disposal in sites. Um, the lead credit is actually much stronger. Um, and then there are credits that are pretty much exactly the same. Uh, at this point, um, our technical teams are working to evaluate the full overlap between the two rating systems, and eventually they will interact, although right now they do not. So as we've noted previously, certification for sites is now available as of June of last year. I'm very happy to report that we have over 30 registered projects that range from entire campus transformation projects, urban landmark, landmarks. We have a cemetery registered. Uh, we had our first corporate campus register the other day. Uh, so it, this should really speak to the opportunity available for projects of all types and sizes. Uh, but looking at what is actually a suitable sites project um, we do need to um, emphasize this first component, which is that sites is currently not available for what we would call existing landscapes. New construction or major renovation is required. Uh, there is no maximum size. Um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing some giant projects come through the door, um, but so far we're, we're in the medium size. Uh, there is a minimum, which is 2,000 square feet. Sites is also now available anywhere in the world, and we do have several international projects registered. And as Micah emphasized, um, and I'll emphasize again, the most important component here is engaging with the program early. Uh, the pre-design assessment, the integrated design team um, is essential and will make it, without doing that, will make it impossible in some cases for certification. So what does the certification process look like? For those of you that are lead users, this should look quite familiar. You register your project with GBCI and you begin implementing and documenting strategies. The major difference between LEED and SITES at this point is because the project volume for SITES is so small that we're learning as we go. We want to capture some of that data and information. Our teams of reviewers, which Micah manages one of, are, will be available to answer questions throughout the process and incredibly accessible. Um, so this is not always the case with LEED, but it's certainly going to be the case with SITES. We want to make this as easy as possible for initial users. For folks that are working on um, many projects, we'll obviously be there to support that as well. Um, you also can split the review process into two parts, a preliminary review um, and then a final review. So all of that is customizable based on the needs of the project team, uh, and, and we're here to support that. Uh, so as we talked about previously, there are 200 total points available, uh, but you need 70 to certify, 85 for silver, 100 for gold, and 135 for platinum. The key thing here to, to emphasize, uh, which we've talked about before, is how the system is designed for maximum flexibility so that it can be customized for project goals, size, geography, et cetera. Um, so that should have been obvious as we went through the rating system, but once you see these points and think of that out as 200, that might help as well. Uh, next, because the goal is to drive sustainability in as many places and spaces as possible, we're really excited about the possibility of sites opening the door to project types that were currently um, not available to evaluate with LEED, uh, open spaces, streets, streetscapes, and plazas. Uh, on the flip side of that, we're also really excited to see what the sectors that are really heavily um, using LEED right now, like commercial, residential, educational, and institutional, are able to do with something new that drives sustainability in, in completely different places. So uh, looking forward to seeing what that uh, turns out to, to yield. And then finally, we get this question a lot. Um, I'm sure we'll continue to get it until um, we're out of business, which is, <laughs> why would you certify? Um, in the case of uh, a project that is already doing all of the components of sites um, anyway, and you capture all of ben the benefits associated with sustainable practices, um, certification creates um, a whole other series of benefits, most important of which is, is demonstrating your commitment to sustainability um, in terms of a marketing and messaging perspective. But I actually think that uh, from a project development perspective, uh, certification is actually the most important thing that a project could do. With so many contractors, pro project team members, etc., working um, on an individual 
project. Um, third party certification allows you to verify your process and outcomes with someone who has really no, no horse in the race. Um, it allows you to work with a common language so that everyone is working to the same goals. Be, um, as, as Hunter was referencing, be creative in achieving certain parts of the rating system and achieving those credits. Um, and then finally, becoming part of a community of SICE users that are able to learn from one another um, and really drive that market change. So in terms of opportunities, um, obviously SITES is available for certification to use on your own projects. Um, it's set up for advocate, uh, to advocate for policies. Um, the ASLA will be one of our leaders in professional education. Um, and, I've, and I've got a few important um, and exciting announcements to make in coming up uh, that, that I think will be relevant for this group. First, we'll be um, launching the SITES Accredited Professional Program um, at our flagship event of GreenBuild this year which is uh, in LA, so that presents another opportunity for the state of California and um, the folks that live and work here to highlight their good work. Um, we have been able to um, secure a pretty exciting commitment from GSA, the General Service Administration, who will now be using sites in all new projects. Um, so the federal government is committed to this as well. Uh, we're looking for those um, state and local leaders to, to follow suit and are really excited to work with those teams on that. And, and then finally, um, we hope to be able to announce our first rounds of certification um, under version two at GreenBuild this year. Just to wrap us up here, um, we do have um, several resources available for those of you that would like to learn more and that would like to begin using sites. First, the rating system of which we previewed during this presentation is available for free on our website, which is sustainablesites.org. The reference guide, which really goes into every single credit and how you achieve that credit, uh, will be the basis for the accredited professional program that is available for purchase on our website. Um, you can register your projects online um, and then begin interacting with our team as soon as you'd like to. Uh, in terms of fees, uh, this is something I just want to quickly cover. Um, unlike with LEED, uh, SITES is a flat fee regardless of the size of the project. Um, you can pay registration certification uh, as a combined cost and receive a discount there, or you can register and then uh, pay for certification down the road, uh, and it's a little bit more. Uh, and then finally, here's contact info for myself and Lynette, although all of us here today are available at any time to speak with you about um, your projects, your interests in the program, and how we can um, really support the work that you're doing. I, I think the, f the final thing we want to get across is that we are here to support uh, interested parties who want to be first movers. Um, this, I think, is equivalent to being in the room 20 years ago as LEAD was being founded and really thinking of the people that were able to shape the program as a result. So as this continues to be um, considered in the work that you do, we're here to support and want to hear that market feedback from you about what's working, what's not working, what you need from us, um, and we will be responsive. So. Thanks again for your uh, time today and the opportunity. Well, thank you very much for a very informative presentation. Uh, do any other committee members have any questions that care to ask? Well, the questions are going to fire. I'm really excited about this program. I look forward to the day of the state of California dogs as value dogs for practice. Um, I'm trying to connect those the uh, rehab projects that unfortunately are just uh, and or the uh, retail projects that we see. A lot of firms, practitioners, and they may have one signature project they work on a year or two years, and the rest of the time they have just straightforward you know, super architectural problems that they solve. I'm looking forward to the day that we can use this kind of format for that strict retail center that has a fast food restaurant and Starbucks in the corner. Um, any thoughts about how we can make that connection? And Hunter, maybe you have some thoughts. You've done some projects within this. Do you see that connection? Well, that's interesting because over the last couple of days we've been having a version of that conversation in one of the audiences over the last 10 years that we haven't engaged our developers. They have performance, they have to fit it. We always hear that conversation, but I think that's a conversation we should embrace. Um, 
I now live in Charlotte and there's a lot of developers doing a lot of those. And this trip has sort of inspired me to say, okay, wait, how do we go engage that set of movers and shakers? Because universities, municipalities, there's a lot of people that want to embrace this and love it and that's going to be great, right? But there's also a large segment of the economy that could embrace it and be even better. And I don't think we're yet having the conversation. So I'm sort of excited to have the conversation, but I don't think it's happening yet. Yeah. And just having practiced through the rise of the certification, uh, I think it's being practiced for all of us who are in the built environment better because of the early adopters, the agencies, the state, the campuses that have made that understanding that have been built into the private sector. So I'm very optimistic. Yeah, and we do, if I can share an anecdote that's that's sort of in motion right now in, in D.C., there's a Green Street project that is underway that ASLA is associated with, and, and there's going to be a lot of data that's going to come out of it, and what's happening is it's near Chinatown. Um, there's a lot of adjacent development happening, and some of the developers building these, you know, 14, 15, I'm not sure how many, how high, but they're embracing the sustainable site side of things and they're putting in integrated green infrastructure, broader sidewalks for better human activity, those kinds of things. So they're embracing the movement and then there's some of them that aren't and they're, they seem to be having more trouble. The ones that don't want to get on board, which is great because let's celebrate the guys that want, or the, the teams, not guys, but the teams that want to embrace the spirit of what we're all trying to do. Okay, so um, I was just wondering, first of all, in the audience, are there any other professionals um, that are in the next architects or are, are there any representation from like, civil engineers? Well, we have one civil engineer. <laughs> so I guess my question is, um, you know, I'm, I'm assuming, like, about me, that this is something where all the different professions, whether it's mechanical engineers or, um, or architects, will all be involved. So, um, you know, you out, how are you, um, how do you plan to get other professions involved? It's a great question. Um, obviously, because of ASLA's leadership, we've started with this community. Um, but we are tapping the LEAD community um, as well. Um, the practitioners of LEAD um, should and could be familiar with sites and probably work on a sites project um, with ease. Um, we are also looking at how to engage especially civil engineers um, and others that could potentially um, be really impactful there. Uh, so it is on our agenda, and we would very much welcome recommendations of groups that we should be speaking with. And ecologists and arborists and, and everyone else. But you're, you're right. I mean, part, part of the way that we get people involved is that the, the, the rating system requires that they're involved. But what we need is we need all of these professionals to, to advocate for the program and realize the benefit that it has for the project and for their own profession. And landscape architects are obviously the first source, you know, I think our first primary way of pushing and advocating for this program, but there's interest from, you know, everyone involved at the site development level. Anybody else? Anybody from the general public have a comment or question for our guests? No? Hearing none. Well, thank you very much for your you. wonderful presentation. You know, it was very informative. I think we're all learning a lot today. And thank you very much for your time flying out here from Washington, D.C. Uh, and, uh, and we look forward to further developments of the program. We'll see how it starts to get implemented. And just one question I've got here. Uh, the, uh, the certification uh, process for the um, so the, the individual, mm -hmm. uh, has that been developed yet? The accredited professional the program? The accredited professional, I'm sorry. Uh, will be, it is currently in development. While we sit here, we have te test writers in our office yeah. in D.C. writing questions. Uh, we will be launching the test. It will be available by Green Build, which is um, October 5th through 7th. Okay, and so the, uh, somebody would uh, then take this examination and maybe they would get they become an accredited sites professional? Yes. It, the process is similar to the, the LEAP credential, if, if you're familiar with it, but it involves an examination 
and then it involves continuing education. But realizing that there is some overlap with aspects of lead, we are going to streamline the, the continuing education to uh, basically it'll have overlap with the, the continuing education for lead as well. So this program is new, and typically we need to lead better professional responders to have student education. So with the sites, how are you thinking that it's still kind of rolling out? Sure. Uh, I'll speak to that. Yeah, I mean, so one of the, we got rid of the requirement and the, the sites are kind of professional for sites experience because the, pro, the program is so new that we wouldn't have anyone in. The program, uh, we wouldn't have anyone taking the credential. What we did instead is we, we're going to write the exam to make sure that it highlights experience in the field uh, and especially knowledge of sustainability. The, the rating system as written doesn't require that a, a site's AP be you know, part of the team, but that is the whole goal of developing a site's AP is that they can then advocate for the program and they can ensure that it, there is a successful um, certification process in place. And so we're actually thinking that the two are going to sort of bolster each, bolster each other. If you have a, a growing pool of sites professionals, then you know there'll be more interest in the program. They'll just keep building, just like Lee did with its Lee AP. Yeah. And we really feel like there is a, a strong desire for something that recognizes something other than the license, which is obviously the primary one, but something that uh, site design professionals can actually use. Because a lot of them have been left out of lead AP. I don't know what percentage of uh, landscape architects have a lead AP, but I know that out of all of our lead APs, landscape architects only represent 1%. And so having something that landscape architects and other site professionals can, can go to and, and just you know, add to their, their list of credentials that we think is going to be important. Okay, great. I think we had a question. Uh, just a quick question. Of the uh, seven California certified projects, is there more information on your website about those seven? Yes. And are they going to be a resource to discuss their experience with the process? Without speaking for them, we can say that so far they've been very uh, useful in being a resource for the program. All information on all of the pilot credits are available at sustainablesites.org, and you just click on projects. Yeah, and I think the, the project context, are they still on the case studies there? They, we still mm -hmm. list the people involved, and so it, you know they're, they're publicly listed I and have you can reach out to them. I was just looking at it. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you very yeah, much. Any questions? It's on there. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would suggest that we have reached the end of our, of our meeting. So thank you all very much for attending. We stand adjourned.